Beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. Hi everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce you to Andre today. I've known him for a long while, but it is thanks to Fiona, the photographer from episode 5, that we regularly run into each other. Andre himself was one of the models for Fiona's sober and sexy calendar. He represented August in the 2016 edition. Andre was a keen triathlete when I got to know him, and I was interested to find out if and how such extreme exercise play a role in his spirituality. Although Andre has a clear sense of his spirituality, he seems to still be in the process of deciding what the God concept for him is. I love that, because that is what this journey is about, and that is exactly what Meet Me in the Field is about. This podcast is supported by The First Layer, the 12-step workbook on working through the 12 steps in any addiction in 21 sessions. There is also a 24-day step coaching and counseling program available based on The First Layer. For more information in this regard, go to www.freddy.org.za and click through from the notices at the right of the homepage. Meet Me in the Field also enjoys the support of African Travel Kid Adventures and Tours, the travel company that will help you to make the unknown your known. Check them out at africantravelkid.com. Sit back and enjoy Andre's journey. Andre, welcome to Meet Me in the Field, our podcast on spiritual journeys. Spiritual journeys. I'm told I'm pronounced spiritual incorrectly. It is spirit, so therefore it is spiritual journeys, not spiritual journeys. <laughs> so welcome to Meet Me in the Field, our podcast about spiritual journeys. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. I'm doing well today. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking a Saturday afternoon to talk to me, to indulge my little pleasures. And I get the feeling you were actually working when I arrived. Am I right? No, I was just going through a couple of things. I do have some work this weekend, but I wasn't, you know, in the thick of it, really. Okay. Yes. My husband's coined a new Afrikaans word, and it's called SPAG. Word. It's a combination of play and work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you will go into his office to work, but while he's working, you will definitely allow his attention to go away and listen to a podcast and watch a bit of YouTube and just yeah, to, to do other yeah. stuff as well. So, so he... He's in his office, but he's not necessarily working. So that's SPAC. Okay. <laughs> Spill in back. So you've been SPAC-ing. <laughs> yes, that's exactly, cool. exactly what I was doing. So I know that you, you're you from the Platteland somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that you're a professional. And that's it. We don't have to go into the, the professional. But where did you grow up? I was born in Kimberley, of, of all places. The, the, which, big, the big hole. The big hole. But I don't think I recall anything of Kimberley. I remember going back once and then I thought, oh, this kind of feels familiar. But I was, I think, just over a year when we moved away from there. So so how could I remember? So, you know, I'd I'd say that I pretty much grew up in Bloemfontein because I spent, I was there from a year and a half until I was 18. And then I left Bloemfontein. So So you didn't study in Bloemfontein? No. No, okay. I left straight after matric. Okay. Mm. And was that a rational decision? I want to leave this place. You know, a lot of people kind of, I need to get out of this place. I, I think to... it definitely was. Yeah, there was definitely that thing of wanting, I want to break free. <laughs> you know, there was definitely that. But it was also, uh, it was planned that way in a sense that my both my brother and my sister who are older had left the house by then and they were studying at UCT. Okay. And so... You know, my dad was kind of like, you know, would be great if you can study in English and, you know, okay. get away for a bit and that sort of thing. So it was kind of, I knew that that would, was on the cards. Okay. Yeah. So you so, studied at UCT? Yes, yes. Okay. That's why I've been here for, for quite okay, a long cool. time. Yeah. And you grew up Afrikaans? Totally. Both mother and father? Yes. In Bloemfontein? Mm. And was there a significant Afrikaans culture involved with? Things like Cook Sisters, Corporal Punishment, and God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that Afrikaans culture that I... <laughs> All of those things feel like the same thing, really. It just <laughs> oscillates between them. <laughs> yeah, the, the Cook Sisters are kind of 
symbolizes yeah. all, of all kind of entwined. <laughs> Never quite knew the difference. Yeah, I think it was, you know, I have these deja vu moments. Whereas now it doesn't affect me so much when I go back home. But we, I remember on a Saturday, it was always rugby at school uh -huh. that we had to attend. I didn't play rugby in high school, but we had to attend all the main rugby, oh. you know, because I went to a boys school, which was all about rugby. Is and the then, name a color of your top? Yeah. <laughs> oh okay, right. I get it. No wonder. You know, no choice. No choice there. <laughs> But I do have fond memories of that as well. But so, you know, I used to do that. And then after that, I would go home around 12 o'clock. And then it was what we called deja vu. My dad always made spaghetti spag bowl, <laughs> spaghetti bolognese on a Saturday. And then he would sit there and watch cricket and drink whiskey. And, you know, so for me, that was the kind of thing. And it was more about, I think what I'm trying to say, it was more about my dad was like, you know, the main guy in the house and okay. everyone was kind of like just like a real around around him household a should be yes exactly <laughs> the cook sisters and that sort of thing like the other traditions i kind of quite enjoyed you know there was always something mm -hmm. something fresh something, something to nibble on that was freshly homemade yeah you know and milk dot my mother makes the best milk dot still yeah it's mm. nice eh? and she gave him the recipe and i actually spent a day with her and said now show me exactly how you do it so she would follow the recipe and she would say, and then I do X. But while she tells me she does X, as in the recipe, she does Y. <laughs> so I left the, the day thinking, okay, so now I've got the recipe and the explanation and the two don't, don't merge. So I still haven't done my mother's milk. milk oh, well, it seems like you're going to have to take a video of her and a recording. Exactly. Make a YouTube video of <laughs> Because I do think that's the best milk dot. So was your mother a baker? Unfortunately, she, she's a very good cook and she likes trying new things. Okay. But because she was also working quite a lot, she used to just buy things from the, from the taste neighborhood. Okay. How old are you? Uh, 38. 38. Okay, yeah. so you're much younger than I am. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, I'm quite a bit, yeah. Yeah. So, what is the other thing about this sort of God. church thing? Yeah, <laughs> I mean... You know, we used to always go to church and that, and it's only now that I'm doing more of my recent work on, on myself to sort of see, you know, what happened back then. But I wouldn't say back then it was something that really kind of bothered me too okay. much, you know, going to the youth groups and, and doing and being quite involved in some of those things. But I do remember, you know, sitting in church and being incredibly bored at times, like, you know, <laughs> and then going, you know, but it's it's only upon reflection nowadays that I can yeah. actually unpack some of that more. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that I was like, oh, I absolutely hate it. I okay. can't, you know, I, I didn't have that experience cool. personally. Religion for you was your understanding of, of, of spirituality at that stage. Did you think about something I, like spirituality? It was just kind of you go to church and that's that. That's the given. Or yeah, did you absolutely. think about these type of things? I didn't think about the word spiritual at all. Okay. I never thought about that. It was okay. just, this is the way life works. Cool. Yeah. And the involvement in the youth groups and all those type of things, that, that's, just, that's just what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. You know? And your brother and sister before you, did they kind of pave the way for you? They were involved in those things, so you were as well? To a degree, but I wouldn't say that they paved the way. It was more about what my mom instilled. Okay. But it was also not... I think of my mother's upbringing of me fondly you know so there wasn't I didn't feel too much that it was forced upon me either okay. but it was just it was an automatic re response okay. you know it wasn't like oh my brother is like head of you know the youth group it wasn't anything like no, so that are you the youngest yes okay the youngest of three were you spoiled did you have special you know privileges and I, I wasn't during the time well you know, not in relation to my brother and my sister, not. Because okay. my, my dad was brought up very differently to his brothers and sisters, okay. you know. And, and there was a lot of sort of unfairness. And so he made it a point in his life. In okay. fact, that was like the main thing for him. But having said that, I definitely was spoiled because I always had everything that I needed. Okay. You know, maybe not too much and like money thrown at me or whatever. Yeah. But I always had what I needed. And so from that point of view, I actually was spoiled. Okay. 
and you always felt loved and cared for and secure and no not no I think definitely from my dad's side not I didn't know him he was always working was he at the university or what did he do no well he was involved at the university to some extent but he he was specializing to be a cardiologist during my sort of later primary school years and and then he opened his own practice. Oh, good grief. So he was an absent, absent Completely father. Completely just... oh, okay. absent. Entirely. Yeah. I mean, he didn't come to one orchestra thing or... I mean, there was just nothing that yeah. he attended ever. So you play an instrument? Yes, French what? horn. Oh, wow. Mm. Oh, cool. And do you still do it? Not anymore. I mean, I played up until quite recently, but at the, at the moment I'm not playing. Why not? You know that thing of, like, I don't have time? <laughs> That excuse. That excuse. Okay. But yeah, I, I am looking into slotting with a group. Okay. It's the only way that I can really, yeah. you know. Kind of force yourself to do it. Yeah. Mm. I think it's so wonderful that people can play music instruments. So I get so jealous if I hear somebody who can do it and they don't. It's like my husband That's who plays true. beautiful yeah. piano. Yeah. And he does it so seldomly. And I absolutely love it to be in the house while he's playing piano. It's, it's For me... That's one of the closest connections we have. If I'm busy doing something, I hear him in the in the in his office, busy playing piano. It's such a beautiful feeling in the house when that happens. Wow. And I tried to teach myself to play piano, but it was absolutely impossible. Yeah, I, I just couldn't do it, and I don't I don't have the time to take lessons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it <laughs> so did you start playing at school? Uh, yes, in primary school already. Did you have music as a, as a subject at school? We didn't have music <clears throat> as a subject in those days at school, definitely not at this boys', boys school that I went to. <laughs> but we, quite phenomenally, we had this place called the Music Con, which was like a, a music place for after hours. Oh, wow. And it had some of the best people in the world. Oh, fabulous. In the middle of Bloemfontein. I mean, it, it doesn't exist anymore, I don't think, but... It was quite incredible. So that's where I used to go. And we had various orchestras and you, you worked yourself up into a youth orchestra okay. and then we competed in nationals. Oh, you know, wow. so it was Because Bloemfontein, if I remember correctly, had quite a... Or Free State had quite a good youth orchestra. Mm. I remember mm. some kind of... Not that I was ever involved in that type of stuff, but I would re- remember always thinking that there, there seems to be quite a cultural... Hub because you had the mm-hmm. Saint Du Plessis Theatre that also yes, had good productions yes. of, of, on and all those type of things. Okay, what type of teenager were you? Were you uh, the compliant or were you the dark and dark and broody? No, I was so compliant. Oh, yeah. It's frightening. Me as well. And then there were those odd times where I would like, you know, do a, an offsides thing, <laughs> and, and then shock the whole world. So, yeah, and then I'd feel so guilty for oh, weeks, absolutely, yeah. punishing myself. For smoking behind the yeah. building, or, but but that happened every once in a while. Okay, and then you broke away to the second of Sin Cities. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first? Joburg. Oh, Joburg oh, must yes, be the hey. sinnest of Sin Cities mm. to break away to. Mm. <laughs> so, and you came to Cape Town. That's right. What happened then? Now we've got to, we've got Booty in the big city. Yes. With all his freedoms yes. and all the sins around him, what happened? Yeah, that, that really was a big thing <laughs> to me because, first of all, I really couldn't speak English very well because I just never spoke it, even though it was a, a bilingual school that I went to. You know, people spoke Afrikaans. We just, didn't, was, we just didn't use it socially. No. And you need to use it socially to, to know. Yes. I was so lucky when I, got in, when I was in matric, I met an, an Irish-speaking person who spoke no Afrikaans. So I was forced to speak English. And I'm so grateful for that man. Jason is his name. And he fell in love with a f- girlfriend of mine. So we kind of socialized together. Yes. So I spoke a lot of English in matric. Because that, that was fair. For that me. gave me the confidence <clears throat> to actually speak English. So I'm very grateful for that. So you, Afrikaans boy, UCT. Yes. And then, you know, at first I didn't have space in, in res you know, which was quite difficult for me. So I stayed with my brother and my sister and both of them were studying, but were like hip and my brother had piercings and my sister had all these cool friends. <laughs> and, you know, and I was like, oh my word, how am I going to slot into this? So, yeah. so that was very difficult for me. How much older are they than you? 
My sister's five years. Okay. And then my so brother, she was post grad by that stage. Well, she studied medicine, so she okay, was, so she you was, know, in the yeah. thick of it. And my brother was, my brother is only just a year and a half older, but okay. two years in the schooling kind of yes. format, yeah. But I, I remember distinctly, even though I wasn't really, I didn't know that I was gay as such, but I, I knew, obviously, that there was this other side. Something's wrong. Yeah, something is <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> Something's a bit off. <laughs> I had the same sense. Just, 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 it was not center. It was just off. I, I didn't know what the hell it was, but off it was definitely. Yeah, it was so weird. But, <laughs> so I was just so... I remember going like, now is the time, you know? It felt like that sort of freedom that I, you know... So that was more what I experienced when I arrived here, yeah. And what did that freedom mean for you? Did you go clubbing and all those type of things? or Yes. Is it? Okay, cool. Mm. And then, you know, I had a boyfriend quite early on in, I think it was the end of my first year at university. So it also meant that, but at the same time, I found myself very quickly developing a, a double life. Okay. Because I suddenly realized that, oh, I actually don't feel so comfortable that other people should know that I'm gay. Mm. So I started this double life of picking the people that I felt was okay to come out to, okay. and then completely keeping it a secret yeah. to other groups in my life. And your brother and sister, were they included mm -hmm. in the no's or were they the not no's? They were the not no's, even though I think they must have known, but I, I never had an open, open conversation with any okay. of my family members at that stage, cool. yeah. And how did you slot in with struggling with or not speaking a lot of English and studying at an English university, studying a not easy degree? How did you do it's a good question. I don't actually know. <laughs> I must say, you know, it did also help to have my brother and my sister around. Okay. So perhaps unfortunate to some degree, I kind of slotted in with their friends at first, okay. which was, I think it's unfortunate because I didn't quickly form my own friends. I wasn't, wasn't forced enough. Yeah. And because for the first six months I stayed with them in, in the flat, you know, they, there was this incredible woman at UCT who was working in, a, in the administrative office and she said to me, don't worry, it'll take you a couple of months and eventually you'll start dreaming in English and you'll be fine, <laughs> you know. Sweet. So, so that also really kind of helped and I think I just, yeah, just sort of stuck it out, I suppose. She just kind of went with the flow. Yeah. It, this needs to be done, that typical, this needs to be done so I'm going to do it. You just don't yes. really question it, you just move on. Yeah. And eventually you just... It became okay. Yes. And then on Sunday mornings, brother, sister, and playing booty in the church gear after church. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> I don't think I went to church at all for the first year at least. Okay. And nor did my brother and my sister. They also didn't really. You know, it was only sort of later on that I started going again. So you I felt the need. I should fast. I, there was a, a bit of a need for it, yeah. Okay. But it was also, it was back to that, that same thing that I think I had a, a, in childhood of, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay. So feelings of guilt. Yes. Not doing it. And then in, when my brother became a, a very kind of like sort of reborn Christian and all of that, funny enough, due to my own stuff of using and, and that, you know, then... It became, so he started going to church more and then I kind of felt like I, I should go with him and I started doing this particular course at church and everything. But I remember smoking dope before I went and okay. falling in love with another guy at church, which was so taboo and, you know, so it wasn't a very healthy kind of thing for me. Okay. So it was a going through the motion thing? Yes. Did you at any stage think or believe that going to church will cure you of being gay or wanting to be cured of being gay? Definitely. Or, is it? Okay. So that was one of the I things you kind of climbed. quite recently <clears throat> even. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely have got very clear memories of even as, as recent as three years ago. Oh, wow. Thinking, what is my calling in life? Because I started having these, like, you know, with the addictive mind, there's this, like, 
uh, must be like the next Martin Luther King almost or something, yeah. you know, <laughs> or, or just or just go home kind of thing, you know. So I I did have the, these things, thoughts of you know maybe my calling in life is to show people that one, you know, you might be thinking that you gave, but you're actually not, and but oh, that's well. completely obliterated now. Finally, okay. obviously there's always that little bit of aftermath that one sits with, I suppose, but definitely. So what was it, guilt and judgment from from church that made you feel that it's not okay? Yes, even though it, it wasn't as if I was often in a situation where people would preach about how wrong yeah. it was. That wasn't necessarily what happened, but it was just a societal thing that I, I, I kind of knew in, an, in inverted commas that it, it was taboo. It and, ended up and being a self-judgment. Definitely. That's, the, the, that's something that, that I've learned is I judge myself. Oh, I judge no, it's myself. Entirely, yeah. entirely that. And to break that for yeah, me. It's very difficult. I mean, it was until 2011, 2012, where I suddenly discovered that I'm not out and proud. I'm mm. out and extremely ashamed. Mm. It was a terrible growth phase to go through and realize that mm. I need to break the shame. Mm. It was really not a nice growth phase, but I'm very happy that I've, I've gone through that yeah. because I have. Yeah. So, at some stage, you became very sporty. <laughs> there, are, there are two motherfucker of bicycles here in the room with us. <laughs> so, when did this happen? I'm glad that you're here today because I used to have four. Oh my word. <laughs> One so for how, every do you, how do you ride four bicycles? I <laughs> know, um, it's ridiculous. But with, with, with two um, road bikes, because these two are both... This is a mountain bike, okay. and then that's actually more just like a city bike, Okay. which is at the moment just there for show. Okay. But basically, when I first went into rehab, when I came out of there, that's when I started. I always, I always did sport at school and stuff, okay. but that's when I really started... What type Training of sport do you do? So I did triathlon. Okay. But at, it, at school as well? What no. did you do then? Long distance running and Tennis. Swimming. Oh, cool. And hockey. Okay. And I sharp s- shooting like you do as a, as a good as, old... As a cadet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, yeah, I think that was it. So, yeah. was your school a, a, a dual medium? Dual okay. medium, although... There were like for every two classes of English boys, there were five Afrikaans. Oh, okay. Yes. So, but a bit is skewed, but the, yes. the, the, the attempt was there. Because when I got to standard nine, eight, nine, and I didn't play rugby as well, and a friend of mine and I decided kind of, there's a lot of boys who can't play rugby for specific reasons that they have back problems or whatever, but they want to actually partake in a winter sport. Mm. because rugby was the only winter sport there was in our school so we started a a boys hockey team which was so lovely but we couldn't get to play games because all the schools were already in in, in leagues and those type of things that were all English schools so we kind of had to beg schools to please play a game against us and then these children had been playing hockey until they were from the age of God knows what yeah. and they would obliterate us like <laughs> <laughs> it was awful like in 15-0 <laughs> but we were just so glad to get a game to play oh absolutely and, um, yeah. it was just really nice to, to be instrumental in starting something and say kind of you know that this will fulfill a need so you mentioned rehab from what I could gather so as a student there was a bit of partaking in the Cape of Good Dope yes and that just escalated yeah, and I mean, I, my first ecstasy pill was given to me by my sister, which was a fantastic experience. Doctor sister. <laughs> yes. Prescribe. <laughs> Only the best, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I knew, I mean, that evening is when it all shifted for me. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I'd never in my entire life had such an incredible experience. <laughs> and there was no, like, depression the next day. I felt incredible. For weeks, I felt like I could live out my sexuality much more. Okay. So that was the change for me. It wasn't so much the dope, I didn't really enjoy it. But yes, it escalated. And And where did you go dancing that night? We went to a rave, an outdoor rave. Where? Uh, Close to Paul. Okay. 
you know, so it was like back mm. in the rave days, dancing all I'll, night. I'll remember dancing away with a big smile on my face thinking, I must look like a flippin' idiot, but I feel so fabulous. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I always thought I looked so amazing. <laughs> no, no, I'm so self-conscious, so, so, so self, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not everything but confident. Yes. And so I, was, I, I just thought, I must be looking so sheepish with a smile on my face, but I just feel so happy. <laughs> I loved it as well. So, so, so that, that, that was the start of mm. the party phase. Yeah. Were you still at Varsity then? Or? I was still at Varsity. I was, I think, maybe second year. Okay. If that. Maybe even first year still. Okay. But it wasn't as if I continued. I, I often just went out and, and drank alcohol and, and, you know, as excessive as most other students. Yeah. I didn't really miss class okay. or anything like that. So it was still... So you were a student. You were experimenting with the odd drugs. You yes. Were, you were drinking a lot. Mm. Since mm. I went into rehab, my mother is so paranoid. So with each of the grandchildren, when they, she heard that they got drunk one night, she wants me to immediately to intervene. I kind of, no, they're students, they're supposed <laughs> to get pissed. They're oh, supposed yeah. to stay out at night. They're supposed to have car accidents. That's, that's what happens with students. You know, you can't, you can't put a label on everybody who gets pissed. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. No, I, I fully agree. Because my brother, for example, is not an addict at all. Yeah. And, and yet he took quite a, a large amount of drugs okay. during, during the last days. I hate those people. I know. <laughs> But I must also add that that the, the drinking culture, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in South Africa is really bad. Irresponsible. It is no irresponsible. Other word. And it is, I mean, it's all over TV. It's, you know, yeah. like all the sitcoms and soapies and things. It's just, it's like part of who you should be. Yeah. So I do think that that's problematic. But yeah. anyway. And did you hide some of your drug taking behind a veil of spirituality, finding myself and get, becoming more open-minded. I mean, you're in creative industry because a lot of mm. people say, oh, I'm using it to, to, to stimulate the creative juices. And Definitely. D- did and you that's do where that? the dope was, was the thing. Okay. You know, we used to go up to the roof of our Archie building because we spent days and nights there together, students, you know. Yeah. Working through the night and all and of that. You used and then we all often, these models yes. and things. I always think, who the hell does this and how the hell do you do it? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of dope smoking then and, and it was, we all thought it made us more creative. Okay. So there was definitely quite a lot of that, yeah. Cool. And it made me more open minded, I thought. And, yeah. you know. Stranger, hmm. I thought that as well. Because I, I grew up so judgmentally. Mm because of church that when I eventually started using drugs I was very proud of myself that I, that I managed to break away out of the the judgment of which I, I grew up with mm. so I felt very enlightened and yes. freed by it yeah. and I was very yeah. very easy to tell people I do this <clears throat> yes. also because I was this model child kind of see I'm not this model I, I do have a naughty side Yes, <laughs> but the naughty yes. side came and slapped me around and called me Susie. <laughs> <laughs> no respect. No respect whatsoever. <laughs> so, was there any form of searching, spiritually speaking, in your varsity days and after that? I think during my varsity days, not really. Okay. Strangely enough, you know, it. I'd like to think that drugs and alcohol and partying on the weekends is what, what got me through. Okay. Because I remember distinctly, but, but I only know this now because I've done a fair amount of, of work on my, on my addiction, is that I used to, in the early days of it developing, I used to look so forward to the weekend because I knew then I could use or drink or whatever. You know, so... So my entire week, whenever I had a difficult moment, it wasn't like, geez, but there must be something else out there. It was more like, oh, but there's Saturday night. Okay, yeah. You know? <laughs> That's kind of what was, was my spirituality, okay. I suppose. You yeah. know, d- d- uh, going from weekend or event to event. Yeah. And in between, just slogging uh-huh. away. Collecting flyers of car... Yes. <laughs> car windows. 
Because it was the see days where, of dial-up to internet. To see where the next parties were. And <laughs> oh, those were the good old days. Yeah. Dolly Parton sings a song called The Good Old Days When Times Were Bad. <laughs> <laughs> I actually should have made that the theme song for the, for this podcast. <laughs> I must find it and play it somewhere in between. It's a Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton, yeah. Oh, she also she also sang a song. My mistakes are no worse than yours, just because I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that fabulous? <laughs> I think you need to study up on your Dolly Parton culture, now. <laughs> But you know what, I actually really like her and I have a lot of respect for her. So you go, look look those songs up. She is great. She's fabulous. And she's still married to the same guy. Are you serious? She's really got oh, cool. a, a good personal life. Yeah, just a solid person. Yes. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> well, you might have to edit that out if I'm wrong. But YouTube I, for you this you afternoon. Know, <laughs> that's according to the Heisgenut. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's Heisgenut, it must be true. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> they will never tell an untruth in high school. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, that was funny. But you definitely have to yeah. spend some time on YouTube at some stage on Dolly Parton and those two songs. Uh, definitely. And education for you this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when and how did things start going south for you? My memory, if it serves me right. And, also and the memory is quite blue. <laughs> I know. Thank you, yeah, because that's why I need to add that, if it serves me right. But it was definitely in, our, in my final year, which came with an incredible amount of stress. We had a very competitive class, and I just, I couldn't cope. You know, so I started using more, and eventually it started affecting my work. Oh, God. By the grace of God, I managed to keep it together. But as you can hear, it was on my own strength, yeah. you know, and... and and control there was control in that and and i tried to control my using and to some extent managed to and so i got through but but my marks you know fell and and i definitely didn't do nearly as well as i i could have not that it's really that important but it is it's something it was a loss okay and so after that i went to when i graduated I, my first year of working was in johannesburg Oh no, so you yeah. had to move from Cape Town to Johannesburg. Yes. How did that happen? Did you apply for well, jobs? Well, I or? think I, I kind of wanted to as well. Was the geographic? Yeah, it, oh, no, the geographic came later. Okay. For the people who don't know, we, in, in a dictionary we call it geographic when you move city or town thinking that if you move away from where you are that your addiction problem will be solved because you're in a different place. So just a bit of background there. Mm. A sidebar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a it's sidebar and a dark block on the page. Because I still, I still have a lot of thoughts of geographicals. And not okay. to get away from an addiction, but just for myself. Okay, yeah. Mm. So and I think it's a, it's a very important thing. But it may have been a mini geographical, but I only spent about eight months there. Okay. But those eight months were absolute hell. My addiction was completely Because now out of you're control. in party heaven. Yeah. Mm. And it was completely out of control. I mean, I, I went to work hundreds of times not having slept, trying to sort of get through the day. You know, yeah. I, just, I just have horrible, horrible uh, memories of that. And then I did a geographical back to Cape Town. Okay. Thinking I would get away from it. Got a really great job here. And um, probably... For the first year and a half, two years, it was okay. Okay, so you managed to keep things together. Yes, yeah, so the geographical did that thing where it felt like it was working. Okay. And then it, it went out of control. Slowly but surely, <coughs> just kind of... <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you went to, re went to rehab. Yes. Kicking and screaming, or did you say for a No, I actually, I actually went and spoke to a friend of mine that's still a friend of mine in recovery. And I knew she had gone through that. Obviously, I didn't have much detail. So I went yeah, and spoke to her. It's not discuss this thing around dinner tables. Not and really. I think, I think if anything that I, I want to do is I want to make addiction talk, general talk. The, the, the stigma that, that we can't talk about it is, mm. is, is, is wrong. There is so, such a problem. And mm. people don't know where and how to find help. It's a secret thing. So can you help me kind of? No, that's bullshit. Yeah. You know? It's a massive problem. And then she directed you to, to a rehab center. 
she's quite incredible in the way that she helps people because she, I think she knew that it had to come from me. So she didn't say, you better get into a rehab yeah. tomorrow, you know, or today or anything. It was more, it was more about telling her own story yeah. as well, you know. And then I went to go and see an addictions counsellor and I realised that I didn't want to go into that particular place and quite soon after that we found a place that would work for me okay. you know but it was more for myself I think you know and I spoke to my mom, not my dad about it and then went went in yes did, did your parents and your family by that time know that there's a drug problem they definitely knew okay mm. was it ever discussed as in Andre you need to be with your heart a rat cry. Yes, because uh, during that time that I was in Cape Town, I uh, got arrested. Okay. For um, possession. Thankfully, I didn't get a you know any kind of record record or anything like that. But it was it was a very traumatic, traumatic event. Absolutely. Mm. It was a, a family issue by that time. Yeah, I mean they okay. phoned my parents oh, in my the God. middle of the night. <coughs> You, that's the one phone call a parent does not want to get, hey? One of the phone calls a parent does not get. One of the worst experiences of my life. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's quite good to recall that. That's what a lot of people say talking to me on the podcast. Is <laughs> a, a lot of stuff comes back. And then you went to Rehab. And you, yes. was it a 12 step, 12 step Rehab? Yes. Okay. Yes. And you saw God, 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 and how did you feel about that? Again, only now upon reflection, it was a bit. It was. I did, it didn't bother me. So you didn't feel forsaken by God for getting you in the shit? And no, no, no. Not at all. all, okay. No. In fact, it was quite nice to kind of open that chapter again. Oh, awesome. But it, there was definitely a part that was like, oh, I better do this now. Okay. Because I have to kind of... So there was a bit of that. But generally speaking, I, I had an incredible experience there. Okay. Yeah, I really loved it. I loved rap as well. Yeah. <laughs> the minute they closed the gate behind me, it was as if all the cock and dramas now behind me. Like, yes. I was so happy to be in a place where the shit was outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was such a relief. Mm. It was such a mm. relief to just be there. And then you reconnected with religion, or not? You reconnected with, with the spiritual principles of religion? I think both. Okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, perhaps. A bit too much with the religious part of it. Okay. That if I if I prayed every morning, you know, I would get so and such and such so and so. Oh. <laughs> you know, so th- so th- it was both, mm. and yeah. I, I still battle with that, with the the religious part. Okay, as in, you want to, how can I put this? Your upbringing tells you that you need to be in a certain place with 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 your higher power mm. but it doesn't really resonate with you or or it does resonate with you but then you engage with addictive abundance or uh, more about the for me the religious thing is more about i don't want to say punishing but a bit of a mm. punishing god yep. that god is over there and i have to do x y and z or in, you'll be punished or yeah or i'll be yeah. punished for it and then i i you know, had these moments, I still do, a lot less, but, you know, if something bad happened to me, just life on life's terms, yeah. but if something bad happened in my life, then I'll think like, oh no, I haven't prayed for five days. Oh my word, okay, right. Mm. So it's the nearly the reward system. If Definitely. you do, I, I will not let that happen. Yes. Okay. I remember as a child, as a teenager, getting into bed stuff. and not feeling like praying. Yes. Just not wanting to pray. Mm. I'd be so afraid that I might die during the night and go to, de- go to hell. Wow. I remember so well that I, I, I prayed out of fear of going to hell. Yes. Not because I wanted to connect oh, with, a, with a God or with anything. It was so awful. Yeah. No, and I, I definitely still have quite a, quite a bit of traces of that. Now, having lost a friend recently, I also... Well, that brings up all, all, brings those up type all of that things, sort of stuff. Mm. 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 It's a bit of an existential crisis for you. Because that happened yeah. recently. Yes. And from the little bit I know about you, mm-hmm. you don't seem like the type of person that easily asks for help. Definitely. <laughs> I, I don't easily ask for help. I Just from the sport you chose, 
Yes. You, you, you do individual sports where you oh, drive yourself mm. very, very hard. Very. You know? I mean, so, that sport was a complete addiction. It's amazing There's how no little addicts engage in, in sports. Yeah. That's why when I played hockey at school, my mother had to almost force me into it. I mean, there was camaraderie in the sense that quite a lot of us that did triathlon trained together. Yeah. And, and that was definitely actually the part that yeah, I enjoyed with, with athletics, yeah. Until we started competing against each other. Yeah. Just, then yeah. all bets are off. <laughs> okay, well, you know. The minute the shot goes, it's like... In, and I borrow in, your bicycle bump? No. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Now I know where we stand, you know. You want to do what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, but I, I definitely do battle to ask for help because I think one of my, one of the main things I do is I think, oh, well, if I ask for help, they're going to say this and then they're going to do this and then I have to do that and I don't want that. Ah. So I already play, play yes. it through as if I know exactly what's going to happen. It's like, I don't want to call my sponsor because I know what he's going to tell me. That's How will I happens. know what somebody's going to tell me? I know. <laughs> and that happens a lot to me. But, yeah. but I've, I've been reaching out more. Um, and when I lost this friend this week, I, I reached out and it actually was quite an incredible experience because it's quite a new sponsor for me and it took us into a new level. Oh, fantastic. It took us a level up in our yeah. spiritual journey oh, together. Oh, cool. Yeah. Lovely. Do you still do sport? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I, I, Hence the I, fact thank, that you say... Thank goodness for, I mean, I'm not old, but you know, I'm not in my twenties anymore. Yeah. So thank goodness for that because I can't do that amount of sport anymore. I just, yeah. I'll die. But so I, I, it's a, it's definitely a big part of my life. Did you use triathlon as a, how can I put this, punishment tool, like yes. an over exercise until you're no, so totally. bloody exhausted that you can't engage with life type of yeah. thing. Okay. And I remember, you know, days of going out cycling for six, seven hours and then coming back and and feeling like the days when I had a hangover that I quite enjoyed because oh. my head was quiet. Because okay. I was like a vegetable yeah. for the rest of the day. I also so was, only realized afterwards with my athletics is that mm. I trained to the point of absolute exhaustion Yes, because then I couldn't deal with anything. Yeah. I, I, it was, it, you were right, there, there was a quietness. Yeah, it was quietness. okay because now I don't have to because I'm flipping exhausted. Yeah. But it, so it was that... It fed into my eating disorder massively. Ah. I mean, it was, it was a big thing. Also, the, one of the main things for me was that it made me feel more masculine. Okay. Yes. Because it was kind of quite a endurance sport. Yes. And it's, you know, you it's swim really, and then you cycle. And it's really boots. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I don't know, with those tights and everything. But, <laughs> But it's got a it's got a butch factor to yeah. it, definitely. To, to, to it's drive like, yourself to that yes, level, yes. Um, it's only men who can do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as things stand at the moment, mm. what is spirituality for you? Mm. Sure, that's a good question. I'm almost nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> Breathe deeply. <laughs> do you want to cycle around the block quickly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That would definitely help. You'll disappear for seven hours. <laughs> no, I think. You know, I, at the moment where I experience it most is, is by going to meetings. Okay. You know, I, I, I definitely don't always like meetings. No. Um, no, no. I mean, sometimes I'm quite irritated, but, but there's meetings. such an incredible spirituality there that, that just connects all of us. So that's, that's a, a great thing for me. And then I experience it a lot in my interaction with people on a daily basis because okay. of where I work as well. I work in a place where there's lots of different cultures and people from all walks of life. Oh, cool. And, and such beautiful people that I experience a spirituality through them. Okay. You know, that's just really interesting. And I think that's really the way we are very lucky in this country that we don't just have middle and upper class. Yeah. Cause there's, you know, there's so many different people that can teach you something about yes. life. So I experience a lot of it there. I do, I probably haven't for the last six months really gone to church, but I, I have found a church that I've, that I've experienced some level of spirituality, but for the time being, I'm taking a break because I want to break away from, from the religious side okay. of it, where I feel guilty if I don't go. Mm. And, you know, I don't want that anymore. Yeah. And cycling, sport? 
I, I wouldn't say it's a spiritual thing for me. Okay. It's something that I really enjoy and I enjoy how I feel afterwards and the acceleration of going downhill. I, like I really do mm. love all of that, you know, and it's nice to be out there, but it's, I think it's probably a lot of it's related to endorphins. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can't say that I'm like totally connected with God or my higher power at that point, but certainly what it does do for me is I work through a lot of things. Okay. So when I'm swimming, for example, I'll think about my day, mm -hmm. you know, so there's definitely... Yeah. Uh, so as things stand today, I think it's the second or third time I've said that already, how do you experience life? Are you happy? Are you content? Are you in a place where, you, where you're okay to be? Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm facing quite a lot of things and I, and I am sort of carrying it over from day to day a bit. Okay. So I'm, I'm battling a little bit to, to stay in the moment and to, to live in the day. But thank God for, for all the tools and for, you know, the help that I do ask for is helping to, to ground me. I think also just, it's just life on life's terms that I'm going through at the moment. I've, you know, I'm coming to an end of a contract of where I'm working. It's a very uncertain time for okay. me. So there's quite a lot of things happening. So you haven't heard about the new job yet? No, Not, okay. no. So it's, well, it's yeah, just a bit of a, you know, it's an uncertainty that yeah. is that sort of underlying. But it is also what's good about that is that it's helping me to to put my focus elsewhere, you know, and to hand over my life yeah. and do a step three. So I'm, I'm kind of, even though I'm on step one at the moment, I, I kind of think about step three yeah. quite a lot, you know. So we have to. Yeah. It doesn't matter where we are, we have yes. to kind of... We have to just accept that nothing you're going to do is going to change the fact that the contract ends and that you've applied for another exactly. job. Nothing is going nothing. to change that. <laughs> That's so good to hear that now yeah. again. Thank you for that. So worrying about that is not going to change it. To think about it is not going to change it. It's just going to... You've taken the action. Yeah, the and I, I hate not having the control. Oh, it's so easy. I'm actually working through codependent, codependent anonymous steps at the moment. I and I just know. came from seeing my sponsor. The general pattern, Freddie wants to control. Yeah. I've yeah, got such that. a control, I'm a control freak. Mm. It's definitely better. I'm far, far, far better at it. And I wonder if it will ever properly disappear. But also it has never that well featured in step work. Now that I'm doing go to step work, that's the level of the onion that comes out. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. Mm. So things are a little bit uncertain for you at the moment. Yes. But are you happy with where you are in life? Are you content to stay in Cape Town? You've got a beautiful place, by the way. I oh, thank you. I love this, this space. It's just such a warm, welcoming, nice, be here space. Yeah, language. thank you. You know, I've got to be honest, I am not in a great space. I think, um, I think it's just also early recovery. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit unsettled. Yeah. I'm, I'm just over six months clean at the moment. And whilst I've got a, a, a little bit in the bank from earlier years and experience of, of things that I won't do again, hopefully. So there's a little bit in the bank from, from years of, of being in the program and that, but a lot of that was obliterated, you know. So, so it's kind of early recovery. And I'm was just, it though? No, not obliterated. Maybe just I, I had to learn certain lessons and I've, uh, I think I've learned them. I am in early recovery. It sounds like you've been, been being very hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> I know. Oh, I all you've lost during a relapse is your clean time. Yeah, yeah. That's all you lose. You don't lose all your knowledge and all your experience. The fact that you didn't apply it in that phase doesn't mean it's gone. Yeah, no, it's that is there. Very true. Just, yeah. just connect with them again. Yeah. No, I do. It sounds like you, you, you prefer to, to move into, into, you sinned, so you need to be punished. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to. Mm. You've already been forgiven. It's fine. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. No, I definitely punish myself a lot. Oh. We are so good at doing that. Yeah. So on that note, yes. stop punishing yourself. Thank it's you. It's a beautiful day outside. Yeah. <laughs> a beautiful autumn day. So I hope you're going to engage in some form of physical activity. Which I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm going to drive home now, have, have lunch and nap. And then I'm seeing a client. So 
I feel so guilty about where we live in such a beautiful place and I just I just don't engage with what we have enough. At least you But now you also punishing yourself <laughs> because <laughs> I think that you are doing incredible work at the moment. I have a lot of respect for what you do and I think it's incredible that you've published a book. Thank you. Really, it, it, it's phenomenal and I think it's also just a, a, a phase of your life that you're going through yeah. to build up, you know. A phase that I'm enjoying so much. Yeah, and I it think is, that's incredible. Yeah. So right now there's, there's not quite the time for it. Yeah. As my husband said to me this morning, you need to take at least one day a weekend off. I don't have that. I'm just mm. busy, busy, busy. And I'm the one who always tells him that he needs to take time off. <laughs> 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 so practice what you preach, sir. Andre, thank you so very much. Yeah, thank you. It Enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed my time spent with Andre. He has such a lovely home, virtually in the heart of Cape Town. It still amazes me how beautiful the world around us is. Through Meet Me in the Field, I have had some of the most amazing conversations with sensational views of Cape Town surrounding us. What a blessing. Andre seems to be going through quite a lot at this stage of his life. Having lost a friend recently, the end of a work contract and early recovery are all challenges which he seems to use as growth opportunities on his spiritual and personal path. I wish him all of the best. He really deserves it. If you want to know more about what I do, please feel free to contact me on my website which is www.freddy.org.za or find me on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash freddy.org.za or on Twitter at at Rensburg Freddy. Remember that Freddy is always spelt with an IE at the end. I want to thank you for listening. Be safe. Bye.